towels somewhere down there, but I put them on the list. Man. So, yeah. She's using it because it's it, good. You know, Try one? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, seriously. Yeah. I gotta wait until after Bible class. Oh, you're afraid you'll get it in the teeth and be. No, no. I actually. Um, for the last few months, have been on a 16-8 program. Intermittent fasting. Yeah. So you only eat for eight hours a day. And my my target window for eight hours a day is between noon and seven, eight o'clock. Yeah. You ever read that book, The Maker's Diet? Mm -hmm. It's about a guy that had like 12 different things wrong with him. He was a six foot something guy and he weighed only like 110 pounds. He looked terrible. But then he started it's eating a, the Bible the way the Bible says, and you know, that's why he calls the Maker, so the God, God who made you. Very interesting. I don't eat like that, but it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, one of my goals is actually trying to get to. Um, one second. Trying to get to um, uh, a full day, uh, 24 hour fast, and to do that regularly. I used to do it when I worked. I used to do it every Monday. Yeah, a small package, and they have that box. Yeah. Wouldn't eat. So anyway, I buy these for my mom. With my mom. Divide them up into. It's almost impossible. If I don't eat, she won't eat. You know. Right. Right. That's no water too. No, no, no water. No, no, no. Oh, it's just no food. Correct. No food. Okay. Coffee is a with the plain coffee and plain tea is um, exempt. Okay. What's the food on here? Oh my gosh, don't you What's that fruit? No. Cherries. Dry cherries. That is awesome. Hello. Don't worry. Come on. Sometimes it's like the better rock. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> well, you are related through Christ. You're in Christ. Gosh, I'm, they're I'm glad in you're Christ. in my corner. You're helping me. <laughs> We're all part of the body of Christ. Oh, they they get to come too? <laughs> Uh, one little have interesting to thing have to share. Yep, is at the end of class, um, uh, I actually have to do my team meeting with Aline. So for those of you who remember Aline Kid, if you want to stick around and say hello for a few minutes, you can. Aww. Okay. Um, What's that? The organist. Oh. Yeah, okay. Aline was our organist uh, before you came. Yes, I only got to have know her for a couple of weeks before mm -hmm. she i want to say mm, i think she that, no left. no it's a man it was yeah, a yeah man that was before. steve yeah yes, that was steve right never mind so yeah aline now uh, has was our organist for like about 13 14 years something like that uh she left a couple years ago um job relocation after her daughter graduated from high school um relocated down to uh houston because she works for exxon mobile uh, out of the refinery yes. that was in Joliet. Now they have her down at the corporate headquarters in uh, Houston. But anyway, uh, she's uh, also in the Deaconess program, so I'm still mentoring her in that. So every week we have to go over homework. And yeah, her homework assignment this week is uh, we're talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, so it should uh, be a, a good uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. You know what happens if you have you greater people. than two? Or is no, that I um, no, I help her with the homework. Uh, the professor grades the homework, and, oh, and so now I didn't the, know that there was a professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's out of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. So, um, it, it's interesting because then you know it, it's like when you have your parent helping you with the homework, and then all of a sudden the teacher says, "You got this wrong. How did you come <laughs> oh. up with this?" <laughs> Well, mom helped me with it. Okay, mom got it wrong. Okay, now you know where the problem is. So, you know, I got to I got to make sure I get my homework correct because otherwise I'm going to have a seminary professor sit there and say to Aline, uh, you, you got it wrong. Where did you get this from? Oh, I bet it's My ball. mentor pastor told me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, that was nice pictures. Oh, thank you. So, so just to let you know, like, uh, I will try to finish a little early um, so that I can finish the job and then get going with the team meeting. Uh, and it's a video meeting, so you can actually, we'll see uh, her on the screen for a little bit and say hello. Um, and 
because I told her I have Bible study because right now she's in Belgium. Oh, wow. Goodness. She's getting some good chocolate. And so uh, this is the end of her day, and so this will work out well. That's why uh, we're doing this. Uh, otherwise, our normal team meeting is around 4 p.m. <clears throat> but with that, let's see, quarters on, good. Uh, let's begin with an opening word of prayer. Oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> so we're in the book of Job. Uh, we're at the point of God's, or Yahweh's, uh, two speeches and Job's two responses. Uh, so God has already chimed in and is asking a series of rhetorical questions. Okay, uh, since God is the creator of all things, he's beginning with that creation and saying to Job, okay, where were you when I created everything? If you think you're God, and that was part of Job's thing, <clears throat> is that he wanted to argue in dialogue with God, almost like on, on an equal type basis. And we'll pick up some of those uh, uh, later in the study. Uh, and God is kind of challenging that and saying, wait a minute, I'm God, you're not. And that's something we constantly need to be rem reminded of, okay? Because too often we start thinking, wait a minute, God owes this to me. And the answer is, no, God doesn't. You receive uh, faith uh, as a gift from God. So let's continue with some of these rhetorical questions and have a little bit of fun with them. I should say God has a little bit of fun. Remember, he's, he's speaking this to Job and... You, you just sort of sit there and you just kind of laugh. But uh, if you understand the argument that Job was making, that he had a case to make before God, and so he's putting himself almost like on an equal here. So let's uh, continue on with Job chapter 38, verse 8. So God, I, I picked up, uh, the, unfortunately, this in um, uh, mid-sentence, so to speak. Um, so God is asking this question, you know, who shut in the sea with its doors uh, when it burst out of the womb? When I made clouds, its garment and thick darkness, its swaddling band and prescribed uh, limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. So in this section, you get the idea that God is saying, hey, I created the ocean. Okay, and uses the, pick up some of the words here, uh, who shut in the sea when it burst from the womb. Okay, almost giving you the idea of, uh, you know, childbirth and some of the mess that can co come along with that, you know, bursting out of the womb. Um, whose womb is, was it? It was God's. God was the one that created all of this. Okay, uh, and very clearly God says, when I made the clouds. Okay, um, so again, uh, God is also prescribing limits. Thus far you shall come to the sea and saying, this is as far as you're going to go. Uh, you're not going to go any further. Uh, that's the type of authority that the creator has. Does Job have that authority? So again, God is going to continue on to the next section. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. So let's just first start. At, when was the last time you thought that <coughs> God created and commanded the morning? Almost every day. When I, okay. Especially when I see that sun like this morning. It was Thank you, Jesus. very early. It's, it was a big fireball. We, we, but typically, you know, we don't necessarily always attribute, oh, yeah, God, thank you for bringing us and giving us this beautiful day. Because we often take things for granted. Okay, uh, so if you do appreciate it, great. And then you can understand God's command and saying, yeah, I commanded the morning. And you're like, well, 
the earth is going around the sun, it, it, uh, wrote, it uh, revolves, and, but yet everything is still happening at God's command. So without God, nothing would be happening and there would be nothing. So God is correct, obviously, uh, that yes, he is still taking care of his creation. Um, and God is causing that creation to continue to prosper. Uh, let, let's move on here. Let's go to verse 16. I just wanted to pull this one by itself for a reason. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? And we are, let me just ask this as an interesting, or make this as a statement, that we are still learning more about the ocean and the depths of the sea. Many years ago, I had one of my uh, confirmands, uh, you know, get confirmed, go off to high school, then from high school went off to college, and during her college break, a very intelligent confirmand, uh, she asks me this question uh, that she was asking everybody because she wanted to get their take on it. She said, you know, if you were tasked with the project of trying to find a new life form, where would you want to explore? Would you want to explore uh, outer space or would you want to explore uh, the ocean depth? My quick answer was, we haven't found life in outer space, okay? We are know? constantly finding life in the ocean, okay? Uh, new life forms, so, <clears throat> That's where I would want to look. We still have the ocean depths to explore. So that was, uh, that was actually her premise also, but her, her bottom line, her secondary premise was we get so fascinated with outer space, we forget about the creation that God has already placed us on the earth and saying, let's just continue to explore the earth. We're going to find out much more wonders just here on earth. We don't need to go to the stars. And the stars are coming. Don't worry. Don't worry, Hilda. They're coming. I know where you want to go with this. We're getting there. We're getting there. Verse 17. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehend the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Hey, where is the gate of death? That's a good question. We typically ascribe heaven being above and hell being below, okay? If that is the case, in theory, we could drill down to the center of the earth. You know, you've even had TV shows about that journey to the center of the earth, okay? Uh, and find the, uh, the gate of death uh, and Hades. But let's be honest, we really don't know. Uh, likewise, uh, you get up into the outer space and... There's no way we'll ever see the quote-unquote heavens, per se, uh, where God is residing. So we just have to realize that there's a lot of things we just don't comprehend. The rhetorical questions continue. Verse 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern its path to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Okay, so we may be old, but unlike the common uh, cliche, or sometimes I shouldn't say common, it's the old adage, we are not older than dirt. <laughs> okay, because God used dirt to create Adam. So just keep that in mind. You're not older than dirt. I don't know how many of you have ever heard that phrase, older than dirt. Yeah. That is biblically incorrect, <laughs> okay? Uh, but I understand the idea. So no matter how old you are, you were not around when the creation was taking place, okay? Even though I do like to teach, tease my junior high confirmands because, you know, they look at me and they're like, you're over 21, you're old. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm ancient. I am ancient, uh, let them think whatever they want to. Okay, let's uh, move on here. Verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of snow or have seen the storehouses of ha the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, 
for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? And so this slide also brings up the idea of where is the light distributed to? Where does it come from? Okay. And we have learned that light, especially from the other stars, have been traveling for yes. long time, years and years and years just to get to us. And it just makes us uh, wonder going, wow, how big is this place? Okay, but now let's have a little fun with storehouses of snow. Mm-hmm. When was the last time you, start, you started thinking to yourself, God has a storehouse of snow, mm-hmm. just ready to dump upon us? Bostonians probably think that, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, I know some people who would flinch at that, going, God has a storehouse of snow uh, or hail, but notice, which has been reserved for the time of trouble. Yeah. That, that could just be uh, not necessarily a storehouse, or God can keep it, of course, but God can breathe it, like you breathe the word in for life. He can breathe in, I want snow, and all of a sudden there's snow. It's a thought that he has. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a building where he's storing these places, which it could be because God can do anything, but he can speak life speak things into being right but you're right we usually don't think of it as a storehouse of snow where god is going to sit there time to clear out the storehouse and put a couple feet down upon us and stuff like that um but if you do follow the last of days as the picture of revelation you do get the idea in other places of that uh reigning of uh, sulfur wasn't there a large hail, though, somewhere I don't mm-hmm. know, that killed people, you know, that it came down? As in Genesis. Yeah. So you do have, um, Exodus. yeah, Exodus. yeah. You, you do have God using the elements and will use the elements to his advantage, obviously. Uh, and yes, snow and hail are part of the elements. And so he will use them, um, especially to in the day of trouble when it's God's time or for the day of battle and war. Uh, It's interesting all the different ways in the Old Testament that God delivered his people Israel. Uh, You know, you've got things like uh, clay pots being shattered. Uh, You get even the singing of people. Uh, And so God has has used many creative ways to uh, deal with his enemies. But... um, uh, let, let's go on here. Again, these are just rhetorical questions for Job. Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is on the desert in which there is no man to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass? So, you know, our weathermen in today's world can't predict the weather. Okay, Uh, they definitely can't necessarily control it very well. Uh, But yet, God is asking this of Job and saying, you know, how does the thunderbolt kind of work? Uh, Verse 28, has the reign of a father or who has begotten the drops of dew from whose womb did the ice come forth? And from and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. And so now you get to again God again uh, birthing or causing to exist uh, the dew, um, the ice, the elements of the earth. Now, after talking about the earth, we're now going to make a little bit of a transition uh, into the stars. Okay, verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you establish their rule on the earth. 
Now, I will admit, this is a section that people have taken a, a couple different ways. And so let me at least first begin with how I'm I want you to take this, is after talking about the, the, the atmosphere with the physical elements that we're aware of, like the rain, the hail, the snow, he's, God is now moving beyond the atmosphere into the heavens, so to speak, and now talking about the stars. The, the Pleiades of a constellation, um, Orion, the constellation, uh, the Maseroth, uh, there I got a little couple of notes about some of these things, um, the Orion, uh, the Bear uh, constellation. Um, and do you know the ordinances of heaven? These are the rules, so to speak. Uh, and can you establish their rule on the earth? Is there any connection between what we see in the heavens to the earth. Now, there are some people who have made those connections. And to be fair, you do have the wise men, the magi, who upon seeing a star, God used that star to lead them to the birth of, uh, to where Jesus was at. So once we get down that road, however, I will admit we run to many questions. Because I'm sure, Hilda, you had a comment. You would have a comment about this. Well, I do believe there's there's a God that created people uh, or the entities outside of the earth. The universe and the galaxies are so vast. So why would we think that we're the only ones he could create? Just like the, the all the creatures underneath the ocean that we don't even know about. Mm-hmm. It's, it could be the same thing out in space. Yeah, at, at, yeah, and I like your example. There are still many sea creatures we don't even know about. And could there also be life in other galaxies? And so, yes, I've had my junior hires ask me that as a question. Is what happens, Pastor, if we actually did find life in another galaxy per se? Hey, it's part of God's creation. It does not diminish your savior. And do you need a savior? The answer is yes. It's just like if we saw a new species underneath the earth uh, in the depths of the ocean, and we do know that there's still, every once in a while something comes up to the surface and we just look at this and go, where did this come from? It came from the ocean depth. God created it. God created it, thank you. And that's the exact same thing I want to uh, go to. Um, am I gonna be leading a field trip of our youth to Area 51? The answer is no. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. <laughs> they wouldn't let me in anyhow, you're right. Uh, so I think we need to keep things realistic. And um, that's where, uh, again, we have so much that we can study underneath the oceans and nothing wrong with also exploring uh, outer space. But yet at the same time, if you're saying to me, uh, where's the best use of my money to find a new life form? Right here. <laughs> Let's just stick to Earth here. Uh, it, uh, it costs an awful lot to put uh, those uh, satellites into orbit, but I'm also very thankful for them uh, because if you have a cell phone and you have the internet, you're kind of appreciative of our communication network. But now let's, I want to grab a couple study notes here. The Pleiades and the or and Orion, these are well-known uh, constellations. Pleiades is sometimes popularly called the Seven Sisters. The stars of the constellation are thought to be held together by uh, chains. The ancients used constellation and celestial timekeepers and guides, marking the arrival of fall and winter seasons. Already by 4000 BCs, the Pleiades announced the vernal equinox. Today, they are still recognized for their seasonal significance. You know, what's interesting about the Pleiades, uh, it it's, is a star system that's relatively close, and it's also one that sometimes people think that it's close enough that they could have visited us here on Earth. Um, that's another different uh, topic, but... Uh, it's interesting, the study notes uh, talk about it as the Seven Sisters. Uh, you may be surprised. Uh, there's another look of, uh, another icon of the Pleiades with six stars. Okay, fair enough, it doesn't have to be seven. That you probably are unaware of that you probably see 
every time you're driving. Hmm. Where do you see an icon of six stars? Um, the, the New York. The, the, the woman with a flame. Okay. Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Okay, but well, I'm thinking in your everyday tra travels, and some of you, I don't know, I'm, okay, let me just sort of give it away here. Um, guess what the Pleiades in Japanese is pronounced as? Mm -hmm. Subaru. Yeah. Uh -huh. Subaru. Subaru. So guess what the icon for the Subaru car is? Six stars. Six stars. Mm -hmm. And initially, when they created that icon, they created it more in the pattern of the Pleiades. But nowadays, it kind of got morphed a little bit. But just a little interesting, a little trivia thing. And again, we were continuing to hang on to the stars. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, to realize that, um, uh, and again, I didn't realize this until I was doing just a little bit more background into all of this uh, with the Subaru manufacturer. I'm like, wow, I see that symbol just about every day as I'm driving uh, to church. But let me go to the one that I did struggle with, uh, Maseroth. And I love this Lutheran study note that says, difficult Hebrew term, thank you. <laughs> it was, transliterated here. Uh, refers to a star or a constel constellation uh, from uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse five, that appeared only at certain times of the year as part of the uh, zodiac sign. Bear, uh, literally the lion, the constellation, uh, uh, Ursa uh, Major, the big bear, otherwise also known as the Big Dipper, uh, the stars uh, of which are often called children. These star clusters are under God's provisional dominion. So again, I'm not going to want to spend too much time focusing on the constellations and any teaching that could apply, especially since we have God's word. Hang on to God's word, uh, but yet at the same time, uh, realize that God has given us many wonderful things and to realize these are all coming from God. I didn't create them. Okay, yes. I just, this is probably off the wall, but did they use the Bible then, the astronomers or whoever the ancients to, act, to name the stars? Ooh, so what came first? Um, the name of the star clusters or the Bible? See, the Bible wasn't, wasn't written for, wasn't known. Well, so you got uh, the little note here from the Lutheran <laughs> Study Bible. Uh, already by 4000 BC, the Pleiades uh, announced the vernal equinox. So you had the, the, the Pleiades as the constellation being recognized by early people at about the same time the Bible was being put together. And so I don't know which one was first. Was it like Adam naming the animals and then that's what everyone named it? Or was it, this is what people during the time of like Job and beforehand so called them and said, this is now called the Pleiades or uh, called it the, the bear or whatever. Uh, and then that's what scripture then uses. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Is going to be my final answer. I don't know. Uh, but it does kind of beg an interesting question. Um, was it that the Bible set the term first? Or was it that the world set the term and the Bible used that? But the Bible is the word of God. Right. So then it would be God who named the stars. Yes, God made the stars. Correct. But wouldn't he have named them according to this? Um, did God reveal to us all the names of the stars? And I'm going to say like Adam was allowed to call the animals mm -hmm. and that whatever Adam called it, that was his name. I'm going to say that also applies to the stars, um, that God allowed us human beings to call, um, the stars what they are. Uh, one of my good examples of that is, remember, every language will now call things a little bit differently because of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and I'm sure they were not speaking um, English back during the time of Job. Not even King James English. <laughs> I know I'm probably going to get hate mail on that one. But uh, yeah, more than likely, and it was written down in probably Hebrew, or probably more likely Aramaic, but uh, 
Either way, uh, Hebrew, and uh, Job is actually a very older Hebrew. And that's part of our idea and understanding that uh, Job might have been a contemporary of Abraham. Um, and uh, the style of Hebrew is uh, very, very old, older than um, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But let's, uh, let's continue on here because I'm digressing pretty quickly. Uh, verse 34. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that you may go and say, and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of the <coughs> heavens? when the dust runs into a mass and the, the clods stick together fast. Now, what, what's really, okay, so let's just start with the first part of this is, can you lift up your voice and say, let it be rain and, let the, and have the rain come? Uh, some Maybe. can, Elijah did. Under special, <laughs> yes, the exception, not the norm, under special uh, usage by God. But other than that, uh, Job couldn't do that, neither can I, uh, nor can we call forth lightning, okay? Uh, and and then, then he's going into the whole aspect of the mind. Uh, who, you're kind of like, who kind of created the mind there? Uh, and then he goes back to um, the clouds and to wisdom and has a little interesting thing in there about the tilt of the water skins of the heavens? Could that be a reference to the earth? Now being put on an, uh, a tilt, uh, and then you have when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds stick together uh, fast, what is the composite of a cloud? You know, we're getting a lot of interesting scientific stuff being taught here that really hasn't been realized except for in the last, you know, century or so. But yet you get some formations of it with these rhetorical questions from Job, to which you want to sit there and you go, what would your response be? And be like, uh, but you had a hum comment here. I, I just know that I've listened to a number of people that believe that the world is not round, the earth is not round, but it's more like a sphere, and that there is uh, a, a dome, which would be the firmament mm -hmm. that got created. And then, uh, so it's more like an maybe oval, spherish type thing. Okay. Some believe that it's, others believe that it's flat. There's okay. still a flat earth theory yeah. that's out there. So, yes, yeah, there is. So others believe it's flat. But do we, like you and I and everybody else in this room, can, can honestly say they know exactly that it is round? Because we are told so oftentimes things that are not true. Um, and again, I, if you want to quick search this, you can find Christian groups actually believing a, a flat earth theory. We do not. Okay. Um, but to the exact shape of the, uh, the earth, um, I know a lot of our satellites have done some mapping. But again, you know, sometimes people ask, can we really trust that? Uh, data. Uh, all I can say is I would like to encourage science to continue to study more and more. Um, but the bottom line to it is the most important thing is God created it. And it is God's gift for humanity to work and take care of the earth. And so regardless whether it's the perfect sphere or imperfect sphere, that's another thing. When you get to the, the waters, um, and the firmament, when we got to the flood account in um, Genesis, uh, we, we saw that at the creation account, God created waters above the earth and waters on the earth. And at the flood account, God opened up uh, the firmament and the waters above the earth came down. Henceforth, the flood. And then uh, at least part of our theory behind all of this is that then you had the tilt you had of the uh, the earth on its axis, you had the polar caps forming and the waters receded, okay, as one way of looking at it. Uh, but yet God can still 
create more rain and it can also dry up the rain. Uh, so either way will work. Will God use natural means? The answer is yes. Uh, but it's still God's creation. God's still active in it. It's still his, his taking care of the earth. And so we realize that uh, while God wants the earth to continue, it will continue. But now we're going to change directions a little bit. So we're going to go from uh, the earth to more of, again, that caretaking. That, uh, and so here's the, here's the segue, is we already heard how God is still in control of the elements of the earth. And now God is going to flip, go into more details and saying, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie and wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? So just a couple interesting things. God is basically saying, because he's, he's asking these rhetorical questions, so we're assuming these are things that God is doing that Job doesn't have the answer for, and making sure that the animals get enough food to eat. Okay. Um, including the raven. And when their young ones cry to God for help, have you ever thought of it that way? You've heard a baby bird chirping for mom or dad to feed it. And God is saying, I am listening to that cry of that baby bird. And you're sitting there going, I never thought of it that way. You know, we usually think of the baby bird crying out to its mom or dad, but God is listening. Just a little bit of a nuance to God isn't just out there. God is with us, in us. And when we cry for help, God hears us. Thank you. Okay, you had another question? Yeah, this, this reminds me of Matthew, in the book of Matthew. Like, think about the, the birds and the flowers. Does God not dress the flowers in all mm -hmm. different uh, ways and, and feed the birds. Yep. So he is attentive to every living creature in this earth, mm -hmm. and he's the one who takes care of us. Okay, uh, keep that in mind because he's going to go on to chapter 20, 39, uh, verse 1. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? No. <laughs> Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? Do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. You know, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, it was during my seminary days. We were raising fish, and it came time for one of my fish to kind of give birth. And I remember just sort of staring there at the tank and then all of a sudden, pop, there comes a, a little one and it starts, comes out and starts swimming away. And I'm like, wow, how many times have I woken up in the morning and just seen the little one swimming there at the top and not actually see the actual birthing process? And yeah, it was kind of nice just to see that this is how it works and this is all part of God's design. Um, did I know when it was going to occur? The answer is no. Does God? Yes. And again, it just makes you pause and think that, yes, God knows every single aspect. We, we know in the New Testament, Jesus says that God knows the number of hairs on, your, on our heads, to which we sit there and go, okay, might be less than it was before, but, you know. <laughs> easier to count. <laughs> easier to count, okay. But yet, we, we too often laugh that off until we start looking at some of the words coming to Job and going, no, God knows all this stuff, okay? And he is very active in his creation. Okay, let's go on to the next section. Um, who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home? 
and the salt land for his dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Now, I will admit when you're talking about the wild donkey, obviously they're wild, they're not tamed, okay? And so you get that rhetorical question in there, but just have a little fun with it. Uh, if you pop back to Genesis for a moment, you find out in Genesis 16, verse 12, that Ishmael uh, shall be a wild donkey of man, his hand against everyone, uh, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So you have Ishmael also being described as a wild donkey. So sometimes people say, going back to this Job passage, is this a, a description of Ishmael? Hmm. I wouldn't necessarily ascribe it, but yet scripture does describe Ishmael as a wild donkey. And so I would say just as a wild donkey is difficult to tame, I've never tamed a wild donkey. I don't even know if I've ever seen a wild donkey. I've seen donkeys in zoos. Um, and so I will just take it as it is and just say, yep, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt on that one. Uh, I don't know, but you know, if you can't control it, God, but God does. That's the other beautiful thing to all of that. Um, let's go on to verse nine. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? We're going to have a little fun with this one. Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in, a, in the furrow with ropes? Or will he harrow uh, the valleys after you? Uh, will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave, him to, uh, leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it into your threshing floor? So let's have a little fun with this. Um, who was described as like an ox? Was Old it? Testament. Was it? Huh? Samson. Samson. Samson? Um, wasn't he? I know he was very, very powerful. I don't know if he was described as an ox. That wasn't the first person I was thinking of. Well, I was thinking of one of the disciples because you see that in churches. Right, you see that in churches. And I'm thinking Old Testament. How about Nebuchadnezzar? Do you remember? Oh, because he turned like an animal after. Yeah, and he yeah, started he grazing grass. and eating yeah. grass. Okay. Um, so, no, I don't want to go there either. Okay. But uh, apparently a wild ox is difficult to tame. Uh, and they're very, very strong. And so you really can't bind them with ropes. Uh, but yet we need ox. At least they needed ox back then to help with the cultivating the land and bring in the harvest. Uh, but then you, you got to almost have a little fun with uh, verse 12. Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain? You've heard the phrase, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the grain. Mm -hmm. So that means the ox is munching on the grain. Is he going to return that grain to you? Uh, the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Through fertilizer, yes. <laughs> He's not going to gather that that grain and bring it to your threshing floor. No, he's going to eat that grain and replenish the earth. Ah, uh, yes, he's going to return the grain, but in the form of a fertilizer. So again, you just have a little bit of fun with this. But you know, God is talking to Job in all of this, and you're like, yeah, I don't know the answer. And boy, you're really mocking Job at this point. Uh, <laughs> let's go on here. Oh, I know. Well, no, he kind of deserved it, but that's a different saying. story. Okay, let's go on. Verse 13. The wings of an ostrich wave proudly, but they are the pinions and plumage of love. Uh, but are they the, uh, the pinions and plumage of love? For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers. Though through her labor be in vain, yet she has no fear because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no shame and understanding. When she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. 
First of all, I didn't realize this about ostriches. I guess in my previous readings of Job, I just kind of went over it kind of quickly. I didn't realize they sort of sort of just lay their eggs and go do their own thing. Um, and sometimes they are described as being cruel even to their own offspring. Uh, but yet you get to verse 18. Uh, when she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider, referring to the speed, that the ostriches are very, very, very fast. But now let's bring up some interesting Old Testament references to the ostriches. From Lamentations chapter 4, verse 3, even jackals offer uh, the, the breast. They nurse their young, but the daughters of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Interesting how God then uses this cruelty and describes his own people and says, hey, the jackals, they take care of their young. Not so my people. And then you have the horse and the rider reference from Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So you should have gotten maybe a couple of those. Uh, I may have gotten the, the 15 one, but you may not have picked up the Lamentation 4 verse 3 one. That, yeah, God has really called his own people and saying, we're that cruel. We don't take care of our offspring. And we're like, yes, I do. Uh, but that's an interesting challenge, especially as we look at the church going forward. Have we really done a very good job in taking care of uh, the churches and trying to raise up leaders and to raise up the next generation of Christians? Or have we been a little bit cruel to it and been only focused on ourselves? But this wouldn't be the first time, I'll just put it that way. But let's continue on here, because uh, I at least want to get a couple more slides in here. Let's Now we're going to talk about the horse. 19. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majesty, majestic sorting, snorting, is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exalts in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sound, he says, aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of, of the captains and the shouting. I, I will admit, I paused at this point and said, you know, I never thought of it from the horse's point of view, going into battle. You know, the horse just obeys. They don't have a choice. They have a bit in their mouth and they get led. Well, and back in those days, those horses were trained. There's there's war horses and then there are horses yes. for riding. Okay, so you had short horses that were trained to go into battle. Right. And, you know, in my last parish, I, you know, I had somebody who would work for the fire department. And I always kept teasing him. I'm like, you know, you're strange. You know, you, you see a fire and you're like, I can't wait to get in there. Okay, they, they, they thrive for the opportunity to go use the skills that they were trained for and to put them to work, and they go rushing into a fire, whereas if I saw a fire right now in this building, my first reaction would be to leave. How fast can I leave? And they want to rush in. But we need people like that, just like we needed the horses to run into battle when our first reaction would be, um, I'll go the other way. So again, I never thought of it from uh, the horse's point of view, uh, but God is, uh, again, bringing these rhetorical questions to Job. Uh, verse 26. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home on the rocky crag and stronghold. From there he spies out his prey, his eyes behold it from far away. His young ones suck up blood and where the slain are, there is he. So you might be thinking, is that really talking about eagles or 
vultures or, but, you know, you kind of get the idea that these rhetorical questions are coming out and there really is no answer. So we're going to be wrapping up Yahweh's first speech, just to remind us, and then we're going to get just a few verses of Job's response. So let's finish up with um, God's argument here from chapter 40, verse 1. Sorry for the fine print. I just wanted to get a lot on this one slide. And the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Who He who argues with God, let him answer it. So you had all these rhetorical questions and God is now accusing Job, you're finding fault with me. Go ahead. Here's your time of answer. When did Job find fault with God? Job chapter 13, verse 3. But I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to argue my case with God. And God's like, uh-huh. <laughs> Here's your time. 23, verse 4. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. 31 verses 33 through 37. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it. Uh, on me as a crown, I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. Hang on to this. Like a prince. Like I'm in charge here. I may not be the king, but I'm the next in line. I am the prince. I would approach him. Okay, so this is what Job previously said. And now God is getting to the point that says, okay, you know, you're the fault finder. You want to fall fine with the Almighty? That's fine. He who argues with God, let him answer it. Okay, Job, give me your answer. And what was Job's answer? Oh. Verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once. And I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Okay. <laughs> so we go from saying, like a prince, I will approach him, to I am of small account. Okay. I'm putting my hand on my mouth. Let me pick up the study notes here. Like Job, we too may become silent before the Lord. I'm not too sure we too may become silent. We better be silent before the Lord. But uh, it is often to plan our further defense or to pout in rebellious self-righteousness. How much we miss by trying to justify our own lives. God continues to wait for us and loves us with a never-ending love, which is ours in Christ. As the hymn writer we can break our silence and sing, When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil, on Christ, which comes from on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking, stand, stands up too. So how do we answer the Almighty? Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And that's a beautiful way of describing what we do in the liturgy, in the divine service. After the invocation, we go to confession absolution. We confess before God, we're sinners in need of his grace and mercy. And that is our proper place, okay? We're not the princes, so to speak, that says I can argue my case before God. Actually, woe to Christians who do try to argue their case before God, because they're going to find out that they're going to lose, uh, and lose not only their argument, but maybe even lose their faith. 
Yes, I've come across many people who have confessed to believe and trust in Jesus Christ, but then allow something to somewhat get under their skin and they're going like, how can God allow this to occur? The answer is God did. What are you going to learn from it? And they don't want to learn. Instead, they want to tell God that this is wrong and how God should correct it. Be careful with those arguments. But yet, if we look at our own prayer life, maybe in years past, we might have found ourselves very much like Job that says to God, I want to argue my case with you. Instead of saying to God, Lord, have mercy. How can I learn? Increase my faith. Give me the strength and endurance to continue in this faith during these difficult times. Uh, but for right now, we're going to close here. Uh, next week, uh, we're not going to meet because of Vacation Bible School, but we will in two weeks. So uh, let's close uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.